and our panelists will be doing a little bit of uh, introducing of themselves, but we are very pleased to have Mayor Jorge Alorza, Chief Operating Officer Brett Smiley, Public Safety Commissioner Stephen Carre, Chief Police Colonel Hugh Clements, and District Commander Lieutenant Joseph Donnelly. And I also want to point out that in the front row, we have our Councilman Sam Zurier, Ward 2, and Kevin Jackson, Ward 3. So as the mic goes on, if you have any questions you want to direct to Ben, please do. So we're going to start off with our panelists. Just uh, actually, we're going to start off with Mayor Lorza and Brett Smiley. You have a few minutes to tell us what the city has been doing with regards to crime on the east side. Hello? Hello? Good evening, everyone. Give me, give me just a moment. So, so good evening, everyone. that broke in. Second one, we were broken into twice in the past five months. We have surveillance cameras on our house. They attempted to break in on Saturday night again, but our alarm scared them away. That was our third time. Next one, I live on Balton Road. At least three of the eight houses on the street have been broken into in the last two years. And those are just three of many stories that I get from people on the listserv. So I'm going to proceed with some questions right now. The first one is from Mayor Alorza, and it's a two-part question. How would you describe the crime problem that exists on the east side, and why would you, why would you say it exists from a city management perspective? And secondly, do you see a solution, and if so, what would it look like? Well, good evening, everyone, and I'd like to begin by thanking Cheryl for bringing us together. Thank you for everything that you've done to inform the community and for you know, helping us to uh, collectively improve public safety throughout the city and uh, uh, with the focus um, here, in, uh, here in these neighborhoods. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot that we can do and there's a lot that we are doing, uh, but if there's one uh, if there's one message that uh, must resonate above all others is that uh, it really takes the entire community coming together, coming together to do it. And uh, here in Providence, we have, uh, we're very fortunate, we have you know, excellent public safety officials. You know, many of them are here, uh, my commissioner of public safety, my chief of police are here, Lieutenant Donnelly is also, is also here. 
And uh, I want you to know that every single day, the uh, first thing that I do every single morning is I get a report from my Commissioner of Public Safety on public safety and what's happening throughout the city. We meet regularly, we talk regularly, and we take every incident of crime throughout the city extremely, extremely seriously. So I'd like to, I'd like to mention a number of, number of things that we're doing uh, throughout the city and here and here on the east side uh, to address the issue of, uh, to address the issues of violence. So I know more than anything else that if we don't feel safe, then we're just not safe. And the number one job of any mayor, number one job of any public official, is to make sure that all of our residents feel safe. The real crime is And there might be... Oh, shut up! And to anyone, to anyone who tries to deny us, by anyone who, to anyone who tries to deny it, to divide us, by saying that one community's interests are above another community's interests, I say this. We can all agree on this basic, simple point. Can you imagine the thought of someone breaking into your house while you're home sleeping? That's terrifying, whoever you are, and wherever you live. And I'd like, to, I'd like to share a number of things that we're doing here in the city to address this. There have been a number of arrests recently. A number of arrests of uh, people who are suspected of breaking into homes. Sometimes they're caught in the act, sometimes they're caught because of good police work and follow up after that. And a step that I've taken is I've reached out to the Attorney General. You know, one frustrating thing, I know it's frustrating for all of you and it's frustrating to us just as much. We actually catch someone. We catch someone, we hand them over to the, to the prosecutor, they get brought to Superior Court, and they're on the street the next day. Sometimes, unfortunately, these folks have, have drug addictions. Sometimes they have other issues. And a couple of days later, they're caught once again. That's just as frustrating to us as it is to you. I've reached out to the Attorney General. I've, I've spoken uh, personally and directly with Attorney General Kilmartin. And I've expressed to him that this is a serious issue for our community and for our city. And he expressed his support. And I'm in the process of reaching out to the courts as well to let them know that this is an issue that I hope they take, they take as seriously as, as we do. I've also appointed a person in my administration to work specifically with neighborhood crime, crime watch groups. And when, we're, when they're working with neighborhood crime watch groups, I'm sorry, sir. So when we're working with neighborhood crime watch groups, you know, the, uh, you know, this is one of the most effective ways that we can help each other out as neighbors to look out over each other's shoulders, to be the eyes in the community, in the neighborhood, when our, when our neighbors aren't home. And uh, this is a person working uh, with uh, neighborhood crime watch groups, even when there are just burgeoning efforts and we want to help to get them forward, we're dedicating city resources to help these community groups uh, get started. Another operation that we have, we have going on right now I know that break-ins have been a serious issue, and, uh, car break-ins have been a serious issue, not just here on the east side, but throughout the city. And we've, uh, we've had a number of sting operations, and we want everyone to know this, where we put a parked car on the side of the street with a laptop in the front seat. And uh, then we just wait. We just wait. And we've done this in, every, and we've done this in, 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 uh, in, in many neighborhoods throughout the city. So the message there is simply, look, we want you to know that you're doing this. So if you're considering breaking into a car, don't do it. You might be breaking into the wrong one. There are also more police officers. There's also more police officers in the, police, in the current police academy coming online. Now, we're never going to arrest our way out of, our, out of, uh, out of our problems. And uh, more cops will never be the solution. But they do it. But they do help. Right now, throughout the city, we have 94 firefighters on staff at any given time. So right now as we speak, there are 94 fire firefighters on staff. At the same time, there are less than a third of that of police officers 
covering the entire city. Now many of you, many of you know uh, efforts that I've taken with the fire department and know that you know, the savings that this will realize, boy, wouldn't I rather spend them on other, other, other kinds of public safety or fixing our schools or fixing our roads or having more youth services. So these are budgetary issues that we're also taking steps to address. Then I've also spoken with my chief and with my public safety commissioner that when this new crop of police officers come online in the spring, I don't want them just on the beat, but I want them walking the streets. I want them riding their bikes. I want their presence to be known in the community. And uh, to be clear, the idea is not to have a presence in the community. The presence. You won't meet with the people who are trying to stop these killings. He's quiet. You run out of money every day. You don't meet with the people who are trying to stop these killings. You guys have to do so, we are not safe when the problem is. So I've instructed my public safety commissioner and also my chief of police that I want the police officers visible in the neighborhoods. And the idea is not. And the issue is not to, you know, have that intimidating presence in the neighborhoods. It's in fact the opposite. The purpose of this is to build relationships in the community. Because at the end of the day, that's what truly makes our neighborhoods and our, and our streets safe. Building those, building those relationships directly with homeowners, with businesses, with kids and neighbors walking on the streets. And then the last piece, and then the last piece is, you know, I've, I've heard from a number of neighbors who have, you know, been, uh, the, uh, have been victims of crime and then have been very disappointed when the police have responded and uh, haven't conducted themselves professionally, meaning the police haven't acted professionally. And I spoke with my public safety commissioner and I've instructed him to, uh, uh, to, to have a training module for every one of our police officers on, in, the, in, the, in the department to make sure that we're constantly reminded that you know, we're here to serve. We're here to serve and even as public safety professionals, we're here to be, uh, we're here to act with customer service and make sure that when people are feeling uh, most, uh, most frustrated, most afraid, because they've just been victimized, that we take that, that we take that all into account and respond and respond appropriately. So there are a number of steps that we're taking, Cheryl, and uh, you know, uh, as uh, as much as we're doing and as much as uh, we're being successful at it, we can always do more. And that will be the attitude that we will always have here, regardless if we cut crime in half or down to zero. We can always do better. And we can always do more. That's the attitude that we have throughout City Hall, and that's certainly the attitude that we have in public safety. Thank you. Before we move to the next question, I just have one sub-question for that. Several people have asked with these new policemen coming in out of the academy, are, they going to be, are there going to be as many retiring as there are coming in? Is the overall number of the force going up? <laughs> you, can never, you can never predict um, with certainty. But it's very likely that after this year, we will need another police academy for the following year to account for any police officers who may retire. So the size of that next academy will depend on how many police, uh, police officers actually do decide to retire. Uh, but we very likely will need another academy after this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is for both Brett Smiley and Mayor Alorza, and that is, how much budget would it take to do what is necessary to alleviate the crime problem? That's an interesting question. It depends. You know, I want to come back to my, my earlier comment that we're never going to arrest our way, uh, uh, arrest our way out of this issue. That's right. you, you, you can't hire more police officers and expect that that in and of itself is going to resolve it. That's right. At the same time, you know, what I've discovered in City Hall over the past 11 months is that there's a lot more that we could do with the resources that we already have. And so I have a huge, huge innovation, lean management, and customer service initiative throughout City Hall. And this is true for the police department as well. We have to constantly look for new and better ways that we can do 
uh, a better job you know, with, uh, with the same resources. However, there are ways that we can use our resources more efficiently. I mentioned very briefly the dispute that I currently have with the firefighters throughout the city. They are, they're, they're, you know, they're not very happy with me right now. There are firefighters who make over $100,000 a year just on overtime. Dear God, they can send their kids to There's a, we spend about $9 million a year on firefighter overtime, just overtime. And as I mentioned, at any given time, you have 94 firefighters on staff. So right this second, we have 94. You look at the last 40 years. The last 40 years, you see with fire retardant material, with better uh, fire inspection, fire codes, the number of fires has gone dramatically down, but the fire services cost continues, continues to increase. Instead of having so many firefighters and so few police officers, we can right-size this to address the issues that we have in the community. And at the same time, if we really want to get serious about addressing these endemic challenges that we have in our community, it's not going to come strictly through a public safety strategy. It has to be an employment strategy, it has to be an education strategy, it has to be a recreation, a parks and community strategy, it all has to come together. So this is not an issue where we can just throw more money at the issue and expect that it's going to be resolved. This is about being smarter about addressing these issues and working to proactively address some of the underlying causes and roots of violence and that's how we're truly going to get at the issue. The last, the last very important piece that we have to take into account is that there's also a public health aspect to all of this. The opioid uh, uh, epidemic that um, virtually every major city throughout the, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country is facing right now is real. It's real, we see people, we see people dying uh, because of their addiction. And once they're addicted, they will do anything. They will do anything to feed that to be to feed that habit. That means breaking into someone's house. That means mugging someone on the street. That means anything. And so we also have to take this public health aspect to this extremely seriously. And it's not something that's going to be addressed simply through public safety. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll add just a little bit about the police budget and, and where we are and where we've been, I think, for everyone to have a little bit of context of some of the budget, budget challenges that the city faces uh, and, and, and some resources that are no longer available that used to be that's important for context as we you know, chart a course into the future to get back to where we need to be. The, I think many people probably remember uh, the high watermark in terms of staffing in the department where there were almost 500 police officers uh, back in 2004, 5, and 6. There was a lot of federal grant money available at the time. Uh, and uh, back then, we were receiving federal grants through the COPS program of eight, six, and seven million dollars a year. Uh, this year, we're receiving 1.2 million dollars in federal grant money. And that is not a, uh, a statement of failure on behalf of the city. That is a fact that the federal government COPS programs have been dramatically cut. And so we're seeing uh, almost seven million dollars. We're seeing almost seven million dollars in reduction in federal aid, which used to go directly to hiring police officers and paying overtime for police officers. And so, uh, as we try to find the right balance between fiscal responsibility and a level of policing that people want and expect, uh, we're facing that challenge in terms of a significant reduction in real dollars of federal aid. Uh, and, and, the mayor's made the point a few times, but another kind of interesting point of context. Over the, the previous four years, we spent $7.8 million in overtime in the police department. Over that same four-year window, we spent $35 million in overtime in the fire department. We have a dramatic uh, budget problem in terms of public safety callback and overtime, and we're working very hard to try to balance that. The, uh, this year, we have budgeted uh, more for police overtime than in the last three years. 
Uh, the mayor continues to invest and make investments in his budget to address this challenge. This is, as I think many of you know, his first budget. We, we introduced the budget in April, so three months on the job, and instructed his team, which I am the one up here is proud to be a member of, and that, in that first budget, our instructions were to find funds for a new police academy, which is what we've done. Uh, as he's referenced, we're expecting and trying to plan ahead in order to accommodate another one thereafter. But this is going to be a long-term uh, challenge. You may have read in the, in the paper this weekend, we recently applied for and received a $225,000 federal grant to do a 10-year fiscal plan. And that's a 10-year plan for the city's finances so that we can chart a financially responsible course over the next decade to really find a path forward that helps meet these obligations in a way that balances the need to not raise taxes, to support our schools, to rebuild our roads, and all of the other budget challenges that we face. But in the context of very real public safety challenges, we need to, we need to think about these cuts to federal aid, how they impact us, uh, and some of the other pressures and strains that we have on our budget. Okay, the next question is for Commissioner Perry, and this is a quote from a resident. We lived in a mixed income section of Manhattan for years without incident. In the last year in Providence, we have witnessed packages stolen off our porch, graffiti defacing our property, an attempted housebreak next door, and car windows smashed within 100 feet of our home. What can be learned from the police tactics of larger, and one would have thought perhaps more dangerous cities, that could be used to get better control of the crime in our community? And as a corollary to that, would police bicycle patrols help? Sure, and we are well aware of uh, the breaks that we've had in these districts, and we are well aware of the larcenies, both from the cars and from porches. Uh, we belong to a international uh, group in which we collaborate not only nationally but internationally. So in your site, New York and Chicago and LA, the Dis Police Department is in a membership with those groups and we belong to uh, a unit within that association that deals with large city uh, problems. We do that for a lot of reasons, but particularly to see what best practices are out there, see innovative ways that we can curb and prevent crime. We constantly do that. We may have an uptick in graffiti. It's removed immediately because we know the impact it has on a neighborhood. We try to apprehend, although difficult, when they do it in the middle of the night. Uh, and we've been successful in identifying and apprehending and prosecuting those graffiti artists. Uh, we don't like it, and we try to prevent it as much as we can. And, and when you have breaks in your homes, I know the, the feeling of the violation when somebody breaks in your home. We've seen it, and the lieutenant will talk more specifically about you know, some, some strategies that we've used and some success in identifying you know, some young, and they're typically adults, males, that, that break into houses, not just one or two, but sometimes 15 and 20 before they're apprehended. And part of the frustration is when they're apprehended in charge, sometimes they're out, and the mayor addressed this earlier, you know, the following day. That's, that's really frustrating to us as well, because we know they either have a drug habit, and they're gonna continue breaking in and stealing various property. So we are, we are looking at, you know, uh, an effort to keep them off the streets and get them counseling because it's going to continue until they get the counseling they need for their substance abuse. Not all of them, but most of them. We've collaborated with other larger cities and towns and the mayor alluded to, you know, one effort in putting a bait car out there and trying to identify those who are breaking into cars and apprehending them. Sometimes that's difficult to do. Some other communities are, are requiring, uh, I, I see an uptick in theft off the porch, whether it's FedEx or UPS. Other communities are looking at models where you have to sign for the package, and the package is left in a place where it's secure. Those are, the, those are some of the things that you know, we're looking at and trying to 
get out there in best practices so we don't continue to have those thefts either in, in sheds, in, in, uh, on the porches of your homes. We know it's a problem. We're, we're doing everything that we can to address it. With a new academy coming on, it gives us 32 new bodies that will have a greater presence, whether it's bike patrol or it's foot patrol in our neighborhoods. That's what we want to do. That's what, what we want to deploy because we know it works and it prevents a lot of these type of crimes that you're experiencing and other neighborhoods are, are experiencing. Thank you. This next question is open for whichever panelists feels that they, that they would like to take it. Could the Providence Police Department provide more specific information on the types of crimes? Larceny of a porch plant, larceny of a bike from a garage, larceny of delivered packages, as well as location and time of event, not the time of the report. Isn't this information public? The more we know, the better we can protect ourselves. Thank you, Cheryl. So yes, uh, the police community partnership works best with is timely and accurate information from the police department to the community relative to crime and relative to issues the police department is dealing with. So presently, that is all public record, but we try to uh, deliver that information to the community and mass uh, as quickly as we can. So certainly if you knew there was a larceny in your neighborhood last night at 725 Hope Street and you wanted that report, certainly you could go down to the police station and get a copy of that. What we try to do is deliver that information en masse to the community, to the respective neighborhoods. So presently, you can go on the Providence Police website and go to crimereports.com and find all of that information. And on that map, you will see uh, scattered T's for theft, scattered A's for assault, and scattered R's for robbery, and so on and so forth. Now, that information is geocoded into a general area, so you won't get an exact location, like 725 Hope Street. You may get Hope in between Rochambeau and uh, Fifth Street. We are presently going to a new system called Open Data Portal, and we'll be upline, and we will uh, be uploading that information as soon as the 45 to 60 days from now. So by the end of the year, maybe sooner. This new system, separate than uh, crimereports.com, will be more specific relative to location and relative to crime. But I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we'll be able to decipher a larceny of a bike from a larceny of a plant on a porch. That may be more difficult. We can certainly work with our IT people and try to uh, narrow it down to a, a better degree for the community. But again, the partnership works best where we provide information to the community in a timely manner and vice versa when the community provides timely information back to the police department. And we've seen that in the last couple of months. And we hate to talk about numbers and percentages, but I think since the last meeting on August 11th till today, we've seen a significant uh, progress in the right direction with crime on the east side. So it, it, it's gone in a very good direction. Uh, Colonel Clemens, one question. Um, we used to get from my listserv very detailed information, and it came directly from the police department. And um, and I, and I'm wondering what happened where we could no longer receive that. I know there was a short time where some information uh, that you originally were receiving you hadn't gotten, but that was a glitch in the RMS system that had been corrected. I can certainly speak to you offline and find out what information you were getting previously that you're not getting now. But uh, we're as transparent as we can be, and we have the Providence Journal in our uh, command staff meetings every single Tuesday, so tomorrow morning they're there to hear our entire report. Okay, all right, thank you. And um, also for Colonel Clemens, how do we protect ourselves and our homes from second floor break-ins? During this past summer, we had a, an uptick in uh, burglaries, especially second floor locations. And we found that many of the construction workers were leaving ladders up on the side of houses. So we went 
house by house where work was being done with the construction crews. And we told those companies to take their ladders down and to stock them away either in the individual's home or to put them back on the truck and take them away. Uh, again, here's an example of that information where once we realized that many of the crews just in an effort of uh, saving time, they would leave their equipment on the grounds, the criminals are looking for an easy opportunity to evade the law. So where they see a ladder up on the side of a house with a window open, absolutely, they're gonna take advantage of that opportunity. So I, we were able to mitigate those big numbers once we got around to all the construction crews and all the homeowners and told them of this very simple procedure. Um, I've gotten reports from people on the listserv saying that people have scaled up the trellis on their house. People have sort of jumped off the car onto an overhang and gotten into the second floor. What can people do to prevent those things short of alarming their second floor windows? First off, they can close them and lock them. And, and I can tell you that. No, seriously. Such a thing as a brick. I know for a fact there was a home that I was keeping an eye on. I knew somebody was on vacation and they were going to be on vacation for a two week period and their second floor window was open. And I couldn't believe that. They think just because it's on the second floor that they can get away with not closing or and or locking that window. Every little thing you can do in your home to make that uh, someone who has criminal intent go to the house next door or to the house down the street or to the neighborhood a block over, every little thing you can do, you should do. Lighting, alarms, locking your doors, closing your garage, or having a dog, and not that you have to have a dog, but all those little things help and, and, and push the person with criminal intent towards another location. Thank you. Um, this next question has to do with the increasing, what seems to be increasing level of violence in the crimes. And this is again open to any panelist who wants to take this. Um, particularly recently on College Hill, there's been three incidents that have been definitely violent. So the questions are three parts. How often are weapons used in these crimes? How often do we get forced entries while people are home? And have we had any violent confrontations, or is that thankfully rare? And what about the violence of wealth? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Which panelist would like to take my question? Are you, are you speaking specifically with burglaries and B&Es? Yeah, well, anything where there's violence, and usually, I mean, that College Hill was not a burglary B&E, and there were three acts of violence there. Assaults, anything on the east side we're talking about. I'll address burglaries first. It's very rare for there to be an assault or any force used if people are home in a burglary. Uh, you'll see nationally and certainly locally statistics tell us and our uh, data tells us the people who break into homes, they're hoping that nobody is home. So it is very rare unless it's a targeted location where they think there's drugs or money in a house. When you hear about a home invasion where people are assaulted either with weapons or physically, more times than not, that's a targeted home invasion. House breaks that individuals are breaking into homes looking for jewelry, cash, and electronic items, they are hoping that nobody is home. And more times than not, if they view somebody in the house, they'll run, they'll leave, they'll go the other way. Okay. Now as far as violence in this, in this city and throughout America, crime and social disorder is a very complicated issue. It really is, and it's always finding that balance of fighting crime and keeping peace in the community. And our focus is laser focused on violent crime, uh, but as well, crime specific to individual neighborhoods. We have many divergent issues in this city. Uh, last summer we had a slew of violent crimes on Apples Avenue in the restaurant nightclub area. Uh, you've seen over the years where we've had, we've been deluged with crimes in the nightclub area downtown, or the nightclubs on Broad Street, or the nightclubs on the waterfront. As well, we have many issues in the colleges, universities, high schools. As well, we have all sorts of crimes in different pockets of the neighborhoods. So we're broken up into 25 different neighborhoods in this city. We have been for centuries. Those neighborhoods have never changed. Smith Hill uh, was Smith Hill three centuries ago, and it's Smith Hill today. Oneyville, College Hill, Summit. Uh, 
So people look at crime in their respective neighborhoods. And what's important to them is what's going on in their neighborhood today or tomorrow. And we get that. So we have many complicated issues throughout this city. Uh, and what may be important to one neighborhood may not be as important to another neighborhood. And we're constantly dealing with that uh, complicated issue of disorder and crime. What about violence during Thank police you. encounters? is, are the criminals we are facing operating independently or are they supporting gangs? If gangs, what is the city doing to combat and win against gang leadership? I'll repeat the second half again. If they're gangs, what is the city doing to combat and win against gang leadership? Most of the criminals who are breaking into homes are operating alone with or with a, uh, an accomplice who may be involved in substance abuse. Uh, there's really not many gang members who are involved in house breaks uh, in any section of the city. We do a lot surrounding gang violence in the city, both in a proactive and reactive way, in a uh, long-term, short-term approach. Certainly, I think we'd all agree that gun violence is far too high around this country, and we've done a lot to mitigate that in this city. Our numbers are uh, significantly down over the last 20 years relative to violence or gun violence. So uh, it, it's always an important issue, and, uh, and we will report our gang database very shortly. We're restructuring that gang database, and that will become public as well. Thank you. Okay, the next question has to do with reporting issues. Once a, and this is for whichever panelist wants to take it. Once a theft is reported, what is the protocol and flow? How is the information in these reports used? Do you use them to track trends or hot spots in crime? Is anyone doing analysis of these crimes in terms of building, times of day, etc.? The underlying question the resident said is that they have submitted five police reports from their address in the past six months for car break-ins and house break-ins, which seems to be a lot from any one address. Is that information being used? Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, we, we are very numbers driven at the police department. Um, and every Tuesday, we do categorize different crimes, areas they've occurred, um, time of day they've occurred, and uh, specific trends in pockets of the, of the neighborhoods. Um, and with that, we, after we've targeted the busiest times, we have what we call our directed patrol units. And um, when we were here the last time, the commissioner and the chief said it was gonna be an open checkbook, we're gonna double uh, the units. We've done that and then some. Um, so every week after we've targeted these, the busiest times and hours, we've sent our teams out, not just to patrol, not just to be uh, present, but specifically to address certain issues in certain areas at certain times. And we've been very effective. Um, I already know, but I want you to know on the east side that we have some of the most respected police officers that work. They're respected by their peers, they're emulated, by the uh, younger officers on the job. So um, they do good work. Just about every meeting, just about every Tuesday, thank you, just about every Tuesday, I can tell the chief we've got a notable arrest, this is what it was, and this is the impact that it may have going forward. So um, that's the strategy we use, and it's been effective. It's got us out of a very busy time in the summer, we're different pockets of the city. Um, we're really being targeted, and our directed patrol units have quieted things down pretty substantially. But do we give up? No. After an arrest, we still stay vigilant. We never think we have all the answers and everything figured out. So we do continue to be vigilant even after this is done. Thank you. Um, one more question on reporting. There seems to be a lot of concern among people on the listserv that not all crimes end up in crimereports.com. There's been several instances of people who have reported something to me that has happened actually to them, and I put it out on the listserv and we don't find it. 
Is there any explanation for this omission? Not that there's a, a, a very good explanation other than this. There are times where it just doesn't benefit us, detective-wise, with our information, uh, that we can, we can give out certain information and they compromise a, a case, number one. Number two, when certain people are victimized, they don't want their addresses, they don't want their names uh, to be posted for obvious reasons, and we need to respect that so they're not victimized again twice. Um, those are the two real main reasons. We're really not trying to keep any secrets. Like the Colonel says, every Tuesday, the Journal is in on our meetings. They hear what we say, they hear what the detectives say, how the cases are either cleared or still uh, open. So it's not that we're trying to hide anything, but um, with the listserv, you can't really always tell who's monitoring the listserv. So it's open to a lot of people, and there's a lot of sensitive information that we sometimes don't want to give. So this is all automated now. So when, when there's a complaint made, so when we talk about an open, open portal, it's all automated. There is no human intervention about what goes out and what doesn't. It's all dumped by our computer. And so whatever is reported, it's going to get dumped out in the public domain so both the media and the community can go and look at their street or their community, first of all. We don't wait until every Tuesday. Uh, I receive, as the mayor we talked about, every arrest that happens in this city, and I heard about the arrest on Hope Street over the weekend about breaking into a car. So uh, these men and women in Providence they don't wait. I don't want you to leave here thinking every Tuesday we readjust. They adjust hour by hour when they need to. And we're trying to be more transparent in the portal. There isn't a police department in this state that is doing what we're doing. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that we need to get information timely to the community. Every single person that's arrested in the city of Providence, we push out publicly because it's public information and you can benefit from seeing what's happening in your city. As we go to the new open portal, that's gonna give incident reports to the public immediately after 24 hours. And then the crime reports also, that's gonna dump additional information every 24 hours. We're trying to be as transparent as possible. The lieutenant talks about you know some cases. There may be some cases that are ongoing that may compromise a criminal investigation but they are rare. As much as we can get out to you, you can help us in either solving or, or we can look at trends and deploy resources accordingly. To add very, very briefly to this, this is, you know, this is part of you know, a number of steps that we've taken and, and the emphasis that we've given to being data-driven, to be evidence-based in everything that we do. And so in public safety, just as with uh, municipal services, we have you know, every incentive, we have you know, every interest in reaching out and making sure that all of our data and all of our information is accurate. So uh, this couldn't be more important to us, uh, to make sure that every single data point is input, to make every single piece of information is captured, and uh, uh, using this, on a daily, on a weekly, on, a, on, a, on an everyday basis, making sure that this is informing what we're doing at the city level, including public safety, so that we can be most effective at what we're doing. And at the end of the day, what this does is, this holds us accountable. It holds us accountable to ourselves, and if we're not meeting our mark in certain areas, I say this to my team all the time, if we're not hitting our, our marks, let's own it. Let's own it and uh, figure out what we need to do to then hit our marks. If we are hitting our, our, our benchmarks and we're surpassing them, well then we have to ask ourselves, well how can we do it even better and better and better? better? This idea of continuous improvement, it's all based on being data-driven, evidence-based, and for that, we have every, every uh, incentive to want to capture all the information. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question has to do with how long criminals are retained once caught. Um, when they're caught, they seem to be quickly released and back on the street to repeat their offenses. Why are they not incarcerated? Are the penalties tough enough to deter them? And what sort of punishment bail would they realistically face for a breaking and entering or for a larceny theft? Build schools, 
So if you have a first offender, 18 years old on a B and E, they're making the street. Uh, you know, bail isn't for incarceration or punishment. Bail is based on their prior criminal history. So we had one most recently, first offense, a B and E. They're out on PR, so they're out on their own recognizances to come back to court to face those charges. Now, when you get to uh, prior offenses, it all depends on the history of that individual, whether or not there's a prior probation or a violation that they now face because of the second offense. So it varies as we're not gonna lock our way out of this and lock you know, these people. We have for the majority an underlying issue and that is behavioral and mental health issues and substance abuse issues. So if we don't deal with that, we're gonna have these people continue to repeat. Uh, and cause, you know, uh, continuous breakings and larcenies in, throughout our, our entire city. So it's not a, as, as, I'd like to see them held a bit longer uh, because I know the effect and perhaps our, our laws in, you know, breaking and entering and the consequences, there's no fear in that. But the bottom line is these people predominantly are suffering from substance abuse issues that we don't address in this country, never, never mind in this uh, in this state. What's your plan for recovery? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to add to that, Sharon. Oh, I'm Did, sorry. So the uh, commissioner spoke about one end of the spectrum where a young man, 18 years of old, uh, gets arrested and it's his first offense, so he's, he's given PR on that charge. As well, we have some hardened career criminals who uh, are the scourge of the neighborhood and throughout their careers they've been doing burglaries and we found that to be the case this past summer where we had a, a gentleman who I had dealt with going back as far as when I was a detective and he's been arrested several times for burglaries and he was really hurting the city, he was hurting this police department, he was hurting these neighborhoods and finally he was apprehended and we saw that reflective in the numbers once he was apprehended and held uh, he needs help, no doubt about it. He needs some help for his addiction, 
I mean, he's getting that now, but he was really hurting this neighborhood with a number of burglaries, and that's the other end of the spectrum. I just wanted to identify that, you know, once somebody builds up a uh, history of criminal activity and then they get apprehended, they are held for longer periods of time. Thank you. Um, to do with information on crimes, uh, someone wants to know, does it include dispositions and actions taken on the case? And how does one access this information on a given crime? And lastly, are there any other statistics or internal slash external reports on crime-related activity beyond what you've already mentioned with crime reports? Okay, that, that's a big question, but I'll try to take it one piece at a time. Um, it reminds me, again, during the summer, uh, there was a victim of a crime and his house was broken into, and he would routinely email me and ask, have they let the uh, suspects out yet that we had arrested? Is he going to court? And as much as I tried to keep up with it from my standpoint, from my uh, police side, it's not easy. And um, in doing so, I discovered this. It was out for a long time, but I hadn't known about it. Uh, it's Vine Link. And I do have worksheets for anybody afterwards who would like to, um, to grab it. It's got the telephone number, and what this does is it will track you right through the whole process, both from the um, arraignment right down to the sentencing. And then once they're in jail, you can actually get an email sent to you when they're released, um, which is great. It's great with uh, not just crime, we deal with the fear of crime, and we get it. That once the suspect is locked up, you have that fear that he may come back, do the same thing. And this really um, will give you the heads up right through the whole process. Um, that's one thing um, you can use. And a second website I think that's helpful when you have your contractors work at your house or anyone who works at the house, it's our Rhode Island banner system. And you can use that as a defendant search. You can find out if your contractor has been arrested or if he has any particular crimes ahead of time before the job even begins. Uh, so you can, you can get access to that through Rhode Island banner and um, that can give you that type of information. Can you give that full address, please, for everybody? <laughs> the last one, it's uh, Rhode Island Banner Courts, and then you'll get the uh, list. It usually comes down under the search as the first uh, search, and it will give you um, defendant search and defendant tracking, uh, and that will uh, get you on that website. That's to, that's to check on the history, and the first leg is to check on with the Vine link that's to check on the whole process through the whole criminal justice system. And um, that can be used, and like I say, I have the, uh, the forms here if you're interested at the end. It's Vine, all caps. Vine is all caps. V, all the banner. Yeah, the, or, exactly, either Rhode Island Court Connect, we call it the banner for short, but under a search engine it will come up on either. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And also, perhaps Lieutenant Downley can email that to me, and I can put it out on the list search for those of you that didn't get it. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, another question here too. Um, this is sort of a, a detailed one, but um, someone wants to know if the if your police department takes fingerprints at crime scenes to compare them with those suspects that you refer to as quote-unquote the same bunch of juveniles or quote-unquote recent released prisoners or quote-unquote known drug addicts? Is there tracking? Yes, um, when any, whenever anyone is arrested, right, they're taking their photograph and their fingerprints for every charge. And many of you know we have an APHIS system. It's an automated fingerprint identification system. So every time thereafter, when they're arrested, we'll again take their fingerprints. Now, once they're in the database, and we have our crime scene units go to the particular crime scenes, and they get what we call a latent print, a print left by a criminal at a scene. At that point, when they get this latent print, they can enter it into the database, and if, and only if, the suspect has been arrested before and is in the system, arrested as an adult, uh, we can also track juveniles, but their history is erased as soon as they turn adult. But if they're in the system and we enter the latent print, they will come up on a search. 
Did I answer your question? You did. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this next question is open to whichever panelist wants to take it. What are you going to do differently? The answer I always seem to hear is that we'll hire more officers, which is presumes that you can afford their salaries, health care, and retirement, which is questionable. How can they catch the thieves so quickly for the governor's police detail that routinely fail to catch and catch thieves who repeatedly use the same MO? Well, I mentioned I mentioned a number of things that we're doing that we're doing differently this year. Uh, reaching out to the AG's offices and uh, uh, also um, you know, talking to the courts about this. And the, uh, the neighborhood crime watch groups, this is, this is a very powerful tool that we have to address crime at the local level. And here to my right, to your left, here in the beginning, here, here, in, the, um, here in the front, is Annie Haroyan, who is a member of my team, and she works directly with community groups that are looking to get uh, neighborhood crime watch groups going and also work with established groups. If there's any support or any connection that you need to City Hall, uh, Annie is the direct liaison uh, to, uh, to, to work with. The, we mentioned the staking operations, putting laptops in front of a, uh, in front of, front of a car and stake it out. The strategy with respect to the new police officers when they come on board, it's not just about having more cops, it's about making sure that they're building relationships with the community and uh, when they do come on board the, in the coming spring, you're going to see them on their bikes, you're going to see them walking the neighborhoods. And uh, that has a deterrent effect, but perhaps most importantly, it makes folks feel safe that there's that, that, there's that police presence. And then I also mentioned that we're working very closely um, on, uh, on training modules to make sure that all of our police officers, that they respond appropriate to the situation. When, uh, when indeed a person is victimized. At the budget level, I mentioned uh, earlier as well, the, um, the, the um, change in, in, uh, in, in shifts of the fire department. And the reason, why, the reason why I did this is because the money that we're spending on the fire department, you know, I would love to have extra dollars to put to public safety, to fix our schools, to fix our roads, to invest in youth services, there's so many other places where we can use these dollars instead of, um, instead of having you know, only about 30 police officers patrolling the entire city um, at any given time. You know, we, can, uh, we, have to find, we have to find resources to do all of this in a comprehensive way so that people feel safe and our streets actually are safe as well. Um, this is a question about the allocation of, of police within the city. How is the allocation of the police force determined? It is, is it by square mile or by population within a given neighborhood? Okay, so, so we break up the districts and the allotment of manpower by area, by neighborhood, by calls for service, and by crime. And there's been a comprehensive look going back nine, ten years ago when we restructured the police department and the districts, and we've looked at it every year since, and it's been constantly similar every single year. So we, again, it's broken up by population, calls for service, crime, and those 25 neighborhoods that I spoke about earlier. We try to make the districts uh, reflective, and the boundaries are broken up by uh, whole neighborhoods, people who identify themselves by neighborhoods. So like, when I was a lieutenant, I worked in District 5, and it was only Oneyville, Hartford, and Silver Lake. And those are neighborhoods that have been intact for 100 years. So it is broken up in a comprehensive way, looking at data, looking at population, looking at calls for service. And I could share that with you. Okay, and is that fluid if there's changes in the, in the communities? It is, and where it's fluid, we can add sector cars. So in many of the neighborhoods, we have three car posts, geographical outlines, and when there's an uptick in crime, we add a sector car, a doubled up sector car. So if the district is known as District 8, and we have car 81, 82, and 83 on the day shift, and we're finding out there's an uptick in larcenies from the auto on the day shift, there would be added to that shift a sector 8 car, which would be a double Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Lieutenant Donnelly. 
Um, if someone is followed and or threatened, would there be anybody in the Brook Street substation at night? This is basically came from someone who was followed and felt threatened and she wasn't sure anyone was home. Well, the Brook Street substation is not manned 24 hours. What we primarily use the substation for is a roll call. It's, um, it's a decentralized police department in that they don't respond to Central Station um, to work in District 8 and 9. They'll take their personal cars to the substation, pick up their mock units, and go in service. Now, if somebody comes to the door in a time of transition of the shifts, they would certainly be able to meet an officer. If someone comes to the door when an officer is working on a report, again, they'll need an officer. But I would be so confident to think that uh, we have 24-hour manning. There's been times we've had interns that cover the day hours that, that's helped us, um, but ordinarily we would tell them to call Central Station. If it's an emergency, obviously 911, the business line, 272-1111, and um, obviously you'll, you'll get a, somebody to speak to and arrange to meet with an officer. Okay, thank you. And also, people were curious about what all the patrol cars outside the Brook Street Station were for. Me too. <laughs> we're in the time of the department right now, and we've had times where we were short police cars. Right now, we have extra police cars with the new SUVs that have been uh, put out on the street. So what you see at the substation are primarily spare cars. And at, in District 8 and 9, we have almost 10 spares. And that's used for our directed patrol, which I spoke about on the weekends. You'll see far less parked there. Um, but ordinarily, uh, most of the Chevy and Pals at this point are spares, and we've been using our SUVs as the primary vehicles. Okay, um, this is a question on strategy. Someone wants to know how much of the police strategy is reactive versus proactive. Basically, is it primarily responding to incidents after they occur, or are there detectives specifically assigned to try to solve problems before it happens again? We do both. We, we do long-term proactive strategies, and as well, much of what we do is driven by the radio. If we were to turn on our police radios right now, it's nonstop. So much of what we do is reactive. We uh, some, oftentimes don't know what's going to occur at 10 o'clock tonight. We could have a string of incidents that we need to react to in a very strong fashion. And there may, may be a particular pattern that is very important to us. And we can strategize and attack that issue as soon as midnight tonight. So we strategize almost daily with patterns and trends throughout the city, our respective to the different districts. But as well, we do many long-term strategies surrounding uh, youth in the community, surrounding gangs, surrounding long-term type crimes like the B&Es on the east side. So it's both. It's both long-term, short-term. It's reactive, proactive. And we look at things in a very macro level at times and other times in a very micro level. So it, it, it's all of the above. It's definitely, you know, there, there's a lot of proactive work that's being done, and uh, the, the chief just mentioned a good, uh, a good part of it, but, you know, everything that we do touches on this issue of, touches on this issue of public safety. Now, here in the, um, here, here throughout the city, for the first time, at least in the history that, that we're aware of, there's full programming in the, in the rec centers. Full pro programming in the rec centers. And we, uh, you know, we we're very proud that we have we have it this year. And this is you know a steady place where young people can come. There are adult role models there. It's a supportive environment, and it's a safe and healthy place for them for them to go. You know, I certainly see this as a proactive step that we're taking throughout the summer. Throughout the summer, we had the. The Midnight Basketball League, which was a great success throughout the summer, and uh, you know, again, this is about providing you know a safe place for people to go where they can feel comfortable, where we create, where we create community, and at each one of the sites throughout the throughout the throughout the summer, the Providence Police was there and the State Police was there, and they were building relationships with the with the community. 
So we're also doing a number of things throughout the city around workforce development, making sure that we're helping our residents skill up so that they qualify for new, new kinds of employment. We're doing a lot around our public schools and around education right now. And so I'm very, very proud of the changes that we're bringing at a cultural level to uh, uh, meet, the needs of our, meet the needs of our children. We also have a program with the Providence After School Alliance where the uh, Providence Police is, uh, having, uh, is uh, playing sports. There's a basketball and a football program where they're you know, working with middle school students and building up those relationships. So I see this all as being very proactive about what we're doing on the public safety front because you know, there's no the quick fix, there's no silver bullet to all of this. It's about creating this comprehensive, safe, and healthy environment for our kids. And that's how we're going to address the issues long term. Thank you. And Mayor Lorzo, on the flip side of that, here's a question from somebody. What do citizens need to do so that our policemen can catch criminals and juvenile criminals and be sure they will help be held accountable no, in the justice no, system? Dude, stop being racist. <laughs> <laughs> I believe one of the most effective things that we can do is be part of a neighborhood crime watch group. And again, Annie Heroyan is uh, a member of the administration who is, who is a liaison to all, of these, uh, to, to all of these organizations. There's a very strong group here, here on the east side. Uh, that's not the case in every, in every community and neighborhood. And so building those relationships between community crime watch groups, uh, neighborhood, neighborhood groups, and even merchant groups all of that is very important. You know, time and again, you know, there are a number of different strategies that have to be taken, but that has been shown to be extremely, uh, extremely successful. And not just extremely successful at preventing crime, but also giving people peace of mind. If you know you're gonna be away, but there's a, a neighbor who's gonna be on the lookout, you know, that certainly makes you feel at ease that, um, that there are gonna be eyes there so we can prevent this from occurring. Thank you. A um, question about street lights. I've had, this is from someone on College Hill who basically said she walked up Halsey Street, noticed that several lights were completely out, very dim, um, got the same thing on Bolton Street. And basically what people are saying is they are understanding that it's National Grid's responsibility, but if National Grid does not fix these lights, what can be done? It currently is National Grid's responsibility, but uh, we've been working, and Brett has been leading the charge on this, uh, working very hard to change that in a way that is going to make the city's bright and the streets brighter. It's going to uh, make the streets safer, and it's going to save the city a lot of money. So I'll let Brett speak to this. Great. Thank you, Mayor. The, all the lights, what we call the Cobra heads, which are the, the aluminum uh, with the, the big, tall street lights. So for folks who live on Benefit Street, it does not include the decorative street lights, but the majority of the street lights in the city are these so-called Cobra heads. Those are, are uh, operated and maintained by National Grid right now, but with the uh, support of state legislators who I see Representative Regenberg and Jello in the back, and we appreciate this, have, have enabled uh, communities to buy their street lights back from National Grid. Uh, because National Grid has had a terrible track record of good maintenance. Uh, they have very little incentive for energy efficiency, being the business of selling power and all. And, and the, it's been a real financial burden to the city. And so the mayor identified this as a cost savings in his first budget. We're actually expecting over a half million dollars in savings this year and we'll have better service for everyone. And so uh, we've worked through a, a cooperative of communities in Rhode Island, a group called PRISM. Uh, the city of Providence will be the first city in the state to have purchased its streetlights back. Uh, we will start that in January. It'll save about a half million dollars a year. You'll start to see upgrades to high efficiency LED lights, and you'll see a much higher degree of service uh, for all of us who want to see our streets lit and lit efficiently, but also uh, have a higher uh, degree of responsiveness to calls for service. And so that by, by May will be fully implemented and uh, hopefully everyone will be benefiting from and appreciating the improvements. Good. Good. Yes. Okay, um, as I understand it, Mayor Alorza needs to leave at 7.30. Um, our other panelists have graciously, graciously agreed to stay for some Q&A, so we'll open it up to the floor right now. 
for as questions just from East Side residents about crime issues on the East Side. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. No, when I call on you. Safety Act that was passed at the state level. In fact, I wrote a letter of my support. And uh, you know, I have been I have been clear from the beginning, and I have supported this. I wrote a letter of support uh, to the uh, to the state legislature. This uh, this bill passed. My commissioner of public safety was also very much in support of it. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work on these efforts to make sure that we have the strong laws in place to achieve this common goal. You know that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. So when we hire police officers, everyone is vetted. Everyone is vetted the same way, regardless of where they come from. So I know the individual that you're talking about, he made a mistake and he was dismissed from the Providence Police because of that mistake. It wasn't as a result of poor vetting or we, we not knowing what his history was. And so unfortunately, some uh, recruits that, that then come on to the police department, across the country by the way, make poor decisions and we react to those and he was properly dealt with and dismissed from the Providence Police. Sir, so when the story came out, he, had had, he was related to somebody and he should have never been hired in the first place. Oh, that's that? the way the story came out. Please clarify. Sure, so don't believe all the stories that you read and its accuracy. So there's more to that. Um, but publicly, this is an employment issue that, look, the Providence Police took swift action, dismissed him from, from the ranks. Unfortunately, he made a bad decision and he paid dearly with a career from it. I have a question. I have a question. See, that you're saying that, you know, issues that need to be addressed on the east side. What about the lower east side, low income area where people are being killed and shot every day with gun violence? What are you doing about that? 
Seeing that you want to talk about East Side Angels, about Oak Street. What about the lower? So we deal with violence, whether it's on the east side or the south side or the west side, the same way across the city. Any violence, any gun uh, shooting, any type of violence is unacceptable and we do everything that we can to prevent it before it happens. So to suggest that we ignore any part of the neighborhood in any part of the city is just false. And we deploy the appropriate resources and we do a lot more than perhaps you don't visually see when we have uh, shootings back and forth between neighborhoods. Are you calling it a liar, Terry? You just said that what he said is false? That's his experience, man. I live, I grew up and live on the east side, but I know the crime rate on the lower east side, the lower income area, is way higher than on Oak Street. So. And, and we, look, the, the data doesn't lie when there is reports of crime. That's public. So for us to either ignore or not deploy the appropriate resources is just not accurate. You know, violence is violence across the city, and we respond to it equally to pro try to prevent it. Then why is there a 